Um, here we go. Regulation of glucose metabolism. So we've talked all about glycolysis and then what happens to pyruvate. Okay, we talked about pyruvate in aerobic and anaerobic conditions because some particular tissues and cells in our body have low supplies of oxygen, don't have mitochondria. So they have to be able to generate ATP different ways. Then we talked about how much ATP do we get if we do run glycolysis in the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle and electron transport all the way through from one molecule of glucose and um, calculated that. So I definitely want you to be able to walk through a calculation like this on the exam if I were to give that, okay? All right, now let's talk about um, regulation of glucose metabolism. How does our body regulate this? I need to shut my door, it's the other way shut. So normal blood glucose concentration. Anybody know what normal blood glucose, the range, what the range should be? Should be around like 70 to 110, 120. Yeah, technically they say 65 to 100 milligrams of glucose per deciliter, which is a little bit, it's one-tenth of a liter of blood. So if you take one-tenth of a liter of your blood, you should have between 65 to 100 milligrams of glucose. Here's what I challenge y'all to do. Do y'all have any sort of scale or weight in your kitchen at home? You should get a little cup and then measure out a gram of glue of sugar. Okay. Which is sucrose, not straight glucose, but it would give you an idea of how much, um, one gram is. And, and then one milligram is one, one thousandth of that of a gram. So it's a pretty small amount, but that's normal, considered normal blood glucose concentration range. All right, low, if we have low blood glucose, so it's constantly fluctuating in our body. This is known as hypoglycemia, whoops. Hypoglycemia. And then the flip of that, if we have too much glucose in our blood, um, high blood glucose levels are known as hyperglycemia. All right. So what regulates this? There's two, um, well, actually, before we get to that, I wanted to ask, what are some symptoms? Because these have effects physiologically on our body. What kind of symptoms are assist associated with low and high? Robin actually may be able to answer this all on her own. Um, low, like if you're low, you're like really, well, like it's kind of the same or it kind of depends on your body really. But if I'm low, I'm like, I get really agitated and I get really like just shaky and I want to shove food down my throat as fast as possible. <laughs> Does your heart start beating fast? That's yeah, why like my, body, my body, like when I'm asleep, if my blood sugar runs low while I'm sleeping, my body will automatically wake me up because, because my heart's beating fast. Cause it's like, you know, wake up, wake up, wake up. Like, cause if I don't wake up, I'll die. And so it's like, gets me really just, and I get out of it. I get like, I'm like, Sometimes I like, I'll start like just, I'm just out of it. I'm just zoning out. Gotcha. So you become agitated. Your body can shake. Um, you might feel fatigued as well. And I, I felt that feeling more like I just need to eat something right now. Um, high blood glucose levels. See, I feel more tired when I'm high. Okay. It makes me really just tired and worn out because my blood sugar is so high. Gotcha. It gives me a headache. You get headaches. Do you do you feel nauseous either way? Um, at the beginning, I feel like I did, but now, like my body's used to it, fluctuating so much. If I'm super high, I feel sick because when you're super high, you know you can go into DKA, and then once you get super high and you've been high for so long, that's when you go into DKA, and you know your organs start shutting down and mm -hmm. you start throwing up and. Gotcha. So different stuff. people might feel different symptoms when they're high or they're low, but nausea is a common one. Um, fatigued, tremors. My sister has type one too, and those are like very similar to how she feels. Like I'm glad she said agitated because she always gets so angry when she's low. 
So that is not oh, just yeah. her. <laughs> it's like if you're low and somebody tries to talk to you and I'm trying to eat, I like yeah. give them the death stare, like leave me alone. I need oh, to yeah. focus on my food. And wow, that's how you were looking at me yesterday, Robin. <laughs> Yeah. No, I'm teasing. So anyways, there are symptoms. These are the high, I mean, our blood glucose can affect our body in, in a lot of really significant ways. So that was just the point I wanted to make, but this is actually the, the primary structure of insulin. And then it shows you, so insulin is two chains of peptides. Um, so you see the blue and the green chain. And then uh, they're, they're held together. These chains are held together. You see these yellow lines. These are disulfide bonds. Okay, so one there, and then there's one right there, and then there's another one right here. And then these hold, um, two, two, two of those are holding the two chains together, um, intradisulfide bonds, or inter, intra-chain disulfide bonds. And then the, the one that's just between the, the blue is the inter-chain disulfide bond. And so they're all between cysteine residues, if you look closely, because those are the amino acids we know that can produce disulfide bonds. So then I just wanted to show you the structure, the, the quaternary structure, that, and well, you see the alpha helices here and then how it's all folded together. <laughs> um, we actually don't have quaternary structure, sorry, it's tertiary structure because um, we don't have multiple subunits, okay? So um, that's insulin. And it's really crazy that such a small protein can have such powerful effects on our body, okay? It doesn't take a huge, big molecule. Um, so that's insulin. And then I wanna talk about glucagon. I don't have a picture of glucagon, but insulin and glucagon are the two regulators of our blood glucose levels, okay? Insulin and glucagon. And it's kind of a fun name, glucagon. Um, they're, they both come from our pancreas, all right? So your pancreas holds um, insulin and glucagon and kind of their zymogen asleep forms. And then when we need them, um, we cleave them and uh, we have them in the active forms. Remember, the zy a zymogen is like a protein that is covalently modified to give you the functional form. Okay, a zymogen is a non-functional protein. Maybe it's got like a little peptide sequence that's cleaved in the middle or on the N or C terminus, and we cleave that off, and then we have the active form. It folds, and it's, it goes and does what it needs so, to do. Like, hold on. So like the zymogen, I remember it's like kind of like, it just like happens like if you get like a cut or like, you know, like something that's traumatic, a traumatic. Right. So because our blood glucose levels fluctuate so much within a single day based on what we're eating and, and our physical activity and all the things, um, these enzymes have to be ready to go in an instant's notice. Right. So what I was going to say is like, so when I like pass out and like, I like hit something is the zymogen is what that's like what's cleaving. And so, cause if I pass out and I hit something, I usually like wake up cause like glucagon is like released. Is that's what like the zymogen's like, like, cause I have a traumatic, like I'm like hitting it. You so, know are, um, well, if, if you pass out and hit something, I mean, your what's causing that is your, your blood glucose levels are, are dropping or, or skyrocketing one of the two, right? Yeah, and so like based I, on that, then yes, enzymes are jumping into action to help your body. Okay. That's what I thought. I just, that yeah, was. it's an immediate response. Okay. So um, this picture is really good. It only shows you the pathway of glucagon though, but here's what you can know. Glucagon and insulin run in reverse. Okay, they have reverse effects on the body. And we're gonna, on the next slide, we're gonna write down what those effects are and what's happening biochemically um, to regulate our blood glucose. So um, glucagon. Glucagon is like these little green dots released from your pancreas. They go to your liver and they start to take glycogen, which is the stored form of glucose. Okay. It's just a long, um, do I have a picture of it? I had a picture of it down here. Yeah. Okay. Like glycogen, all these little red dots would be like individual glucose and they're all branched together, linked together, but we need to start chopping those up and releasing them into the blood so that we can raise our glucose levels because with glucagon, um, it's that we're low. We, we don't have enough glucose in our blood and we need to break down glycogen, make glucose, and then dump that into the blood. Okay. That's what glucagon does in a nutshell. Insulin is the reverse of this. Insulin means we have too much glucose in our blood. So with glucagon, I'm going to actually write this. Goes into action when 
blood um, glucose is low. And we'll come down here with insulin. Goes into action when blood glucose is high. Okay? So glucagon works to increase your blood glucose levels by dumping more glucose into the blood. Insulin works to remove it and lower our blood glucose levels. So all the time, it's like going like this, okay? High and low, bring it back down, raise it back up, bring it back down, raise it back up. I once heard somebody say this. Um, so I was telling about that family, their six-year-old daughter got diagnosed with type one earlier this year. And the parents are having to regulate this for her. I mean, she's sick. She doesn't know what it even means to have type one diabetes. And he described it like this. He said, imagine someone handed you a balloon and you have to just keep that balloon up in the air all day long. And you're just hitting it, like just keeping it up in the air. And can you imagine all day long? So they're just literally watching her blood glucose levels all day. And I mean, I'm going, in, they, they need to prick her finger and give her a shot or whatever, give her insulin. Um, it's just, you're constantly thinking about it. You're constantly worried. And we take this for granted because our bodies do this for us. Those of us who don't have type one diabetes, and it's just phenomenal the way our bodies work. Um, it just, this blows my mind sometimes when I think about and I know it's hard and I know it's complicated. And some of you are like, I don't care what happens in my body, but I hope you can appreciate at least respect your body is doing this for you every second of every day. Um, all right. So let's write these things down. Rising blood glucose concentration. What are some of the things in addition to the release of insulin? What is this, the cascade of events that happens in our body? Well, first off, um, this will, um, increase cellular Uh, and I'm just going to use a capital G for glucose here because I ran out of room. Increase cellular uptake of glucose. So insulin will cause our cells to absorb glucose and get it out of our bloodstream. That's one way it can lower glucose. Another way is speed up glycolysis. If we're running glycolysis, we're breaking down glucose. So we're decreasing the concentration of glucose that way. Okay, metabolize it. <clears throat> store it insulin causes us to store and when i say it i mean glucose as glycogen what's the name of the pathway i mentioned it earlier from the figure do you guys remember the name of the pathway where we are making glycogen Glycogenesis, okay? Genesis means the creation of glycogen. So we can ramp up glycogenesis. Take glucose out of the bloodstream, stored as glycogen. Or if you guys remember, I don't want to scroll all the way back up. Did I have it right down here? No. Um, right down here with acetyl-CoA, acetyl-CoA can be made into lipids. Um, or we can make it into proteins. Okay, we can take, so we could run glycolysis, but instead of making ATP, if we don't need it, um, we can just make, make it into lipids or proteins or mo molecules that we might need. So um, synthesize Okay. Now, this is actually a figure directly from your textbook. If you look through this chapter, the wording of what we just wrote might not be the same as what you see in your textbook, word for word, uh, but essentially it's the same points here. These are ways that insulin works to decrease the concentration of glucose in our blood. And why are we doing that? Because we have a rising blood glucose concentration. This is the issue. We have too much glucose in our blood. So here's some things we can do to lower it and get it into a normal level. Make sense? Okay, on the opposite side, what if the issue is not that we have too much glucose in our blood, what if we have a falling blood glucose concentration? We have too little glucose in our blood. Glucagon, I mean, from looking at this figure up above, is going to help increase the concentration of glucose in our blood. So well, it's just gonna do the opposite of insulin. It's gonna slow down 
I need to zoom in so I can write smaller. Slow down cellular uptake of glucose. Okay. Slow down cellular uptake of glucose. Um, speed up. glycogenolysis. This is the breakdown of glycogen. And that's actually what you see in this picture up here. We're taking glycogen, chopping it up into glucose so we can release it back from our, that, that happens in your liver. We store glycogen in our liver so that it can then be added to our bloodstream. Um, we can, the opposite of uh, the opposite of synthesizing lipids and proteins. If we simply aren't getting enough glucose from our diet, we can take lipids and proteins and we can take the metabolites of those things and we can make glucose, okay? And this is called gluconeogenesis. This is a word we're gonna, a pathway we're gonna get to in a minute. So we can run gluconeogenesis. So if you look up at the figure above, I forget what slide is it on. Um, up earlier. I'm actually looking, it says slice 12 for me. I don't know what slide it is for y'all though. But we can run, no, 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 that's down below, sorry. Uh, it was like slide two or three. That figure um, shows you where gluconeogenesis is. Um, and then we can break down Whoops, lipids and proteins. And we can use those metabolites to make um, glucose via gluconeogenesis. But there's other things that can be used to run gluconeogenesis as well. Pyruvate, um, lactate, other things, not just lipids and proteins, but we can pull our resources if we need to from lipids and proteins. Okay, so questions on how insulin and glucagon work. For sure, expect like some kind of open response or series of multiple choice questions on, on these things and how they regulate glucose metabolism. Okay, what about when you're stressed? Anybody stressed? Okay, um, well, when we use the word stress biochemically, not necessarily how we use it culturally, okay? People walk around saying I'm stressed, um, stress on our body, though, can be induced actually from just actual stress from your job or from your class or whatever. Uh, but more so, we're specifically talking about stress from like starvation, diet, fasting. All right. So how does that affect um, our blood glucose, our metabolism, our ATP production? So um, uh, it's kind of complicated because it kind of pulls from different areas, right? We have to have gl uh, glucose. That's the preferred fuel for our brain. We have to be feeding our brain cells glucose, okay? So if we're running low because maybe we're just not eating enough, um, people fast, people diet, they do low-carb diets, um, then our body has to be able to pull glucose from other areas. Now, what's interesting is that I, we know that glucose is stored as glycogen. So let's say we have too much glucose in our blood, we can store it as glycogen. Okay, but the amount of glycogen and glucose in our body at any given point in time is less than, I mean, look at this stat, represents less than 1% of our energy reserves. Less than 1%. That's, that's, a, that's astonishing. So where do we get all this other energy from? Anybody know? If we are running low on carbs and we're not feeding our body carbs, how are we going to sustain energy? Um. I don't know if this is right, but when I was like diagnosed, obviously like there, like my insulin wasn't breaking down my glucose. So I wasn't having, like, I wasn't getting, you know, carbs and glucose. So I wasn't getting the energy from that. It was like eating at my fat. That's what made me like really like lose a ton of weight and really skinny. And that is a key indicator of a kiddo that has type one. They, they become bone thin and they're eating a ton. 
they're eating and eating and eating all the time, but they're like getting skinny. How many of you are like, I wish I had that problem? No, you don't. You don't want type one diabetes. Okay. Um, so because exactly what Robin said, it's breaking down your fat reserves. Our fat, triacylglycerols, that's our energy reserves. Okay. Um, if you starve your body of, of carbs, if you stopped eating carbs right now, all your glycogen and all your glucose would be used up in 15 to 20 hours. Then your body would revert to start breaking down triacylglycerols and fats to provide energy. Okay. So fatty acid metabolism is actually what we're going to start tomorrow, but I'm just going to give you a, a few bullet points on this. Um, oh, by the way, so glycogen stored in liver and muscle. And then we said it represents less than 1% of our energy reserves. Fatty acid metabolism, so fats are our largest energy reserves. Um, we metabolize them to acetyl-CoA. The end product of fatty acid metabolism is acetyl-CoA. And by now, y'all realize how important of a molecule that is. Because right when you make acetyl-CoA, now we're ready to jump into the citric acid cycle, electron transport chain, boom, we've got ATP. Okay. Um, but this next thing is kind of, um, the leveraging point. It, our bodies don't switch this immediately. It takes several days for our metabolism to switch to a totally different, um, pathway. So full dependence on the metabolism of fatty acids takes several days. It's gradual. It's not immediate. <clears throat> All right. Um, uh, we can also use proteins. Protein metabolism down to amino acids produce glucose via, this is the word we wrote earlier, gluconeogenesis. Remember, genesis means creation, the creation of glucose, okay? Um, and then eventually the production of, so any of you guys heard of ketone bodies? Yeah. Eventually, the production of ketones body, ketone bodies from acetyl-CoA is used for ATP synthesis. So why, where do ketone bodies come into play? Anybody heard of the keto diet? Um, so people that are on the keto diet, they're not using glucose for energy. They are using ketone bodies. So what happens is the breakdown of fatty acids produces tons and tons and tons of, we said, acetyl-CoA. All right. Well, eventually, like, like it produces a huge amount of acetyl-CoA. And eventually, when we, when we fully rely on the breakdown of fatty acids, we get too much acetyl-CoA because acetyl-CoA will then run through the citric acid cycle, electron transport, like we said, make ATP, but we get a buildup of acetyl-CoA, okay? We don't want too much acetyl-CoA. We don't want an overload. It kind of, that's kind of like the bottleneck point. Um, but if we get too much of it, the body resorts to another pathway to alleviate the buildup of acetyl-CoA. And this is where ketone bodies come from, okay? Um, so acetyl-CoA, I'll kind of draw another pathway out here. If we're not gonna run the citric acid cycle because maybe we're doing that enough, we've got plenty of ATP. We don't want an overload of ATP. Um, it will produce ketone bodies, all right? Now, what are ketone bodies? We have a, a small pathway for this. If you want to read more about it, I was actually looking at the pages in your textbook, 702 and 703, kind of walk you through that, this particular section. Um, here's an example of different ketone bodies. Acetone um, is a ketone body, oxalo, or um, acetoacetate, and then 3-hydroxybutyrate. These are all ketone bodies. You can see the ketone functional group in these, okay, right there. This one has two ketone. Oh no, that's a car. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and then acetone, obviously, the carbon, carbon, double oxygen. So, anyways, um, oops. So, anyways, those are different ketone bodies, and we can produce glucose um, and get energy from the metabolism of ketone bodies instead of from glucose. Okay. Now, glucose is the preferred source, but if we just don't have glucose, we can use this to generate ATP. All right. Um, so that's metabolism, like the regulation of, of glucose metabolism. Now we're going to look at, uh, I think, is there two pathways left? Yeah. The buildup and the breakdown of glycogen. Okay. So what are the pathways that specifically build up and break down glycogen? Now, what, here's what I'm going to tell you. Unlike glycolysis, you are not going to have to know every intermediate, and I'm not going to walk you through every intermediate. I'm going to show you the pathway, 
you'll see the intermediates, you'll see the enzymes. Here's what I want you to focus on with glycogen. What is this path used for? When does our body need it? Under what conditions do we begin to break down glycogen? Under what conditions do we store glycogen? Okay. Um, now, if there's a specific name of something I need you to know, I will tell you probably more so the enzymes that help do this. But unlike glycolysis, you're not going to have to know the name of every intermediate and all the enzymes. And they're pretty short pathways. I've got a picture of them in just a second. But the first one is the storage of glycogen. So again, here's glucose in the sum on eraser. Here's glucose. If we don't need ATP, we've got a good energy supply in the body. We boom, make glucose 6-phosphate, and nope, that's glycosis. I forget. It was in the figure. Out. We're going to run um, this path. I actually want to highlight it in yellow. We're going to run this pathway right down here. Okay. This is the pathway we're about to look at. So we're going to take glucose 6-phosphate, convert it to glucose 1-phosphate, follow these blue arrows, and make boom, glycogen down at the bottom. Okay. That's the pathway that we're about to look at. So what is, it's called glycogenesis, the creation of glycogen. It's the biochemical pathway for the synthesis of glycogen, which is just a branched polymer. What do I mean when I say polymer? Okay, this is a picture of a polymer. It's just a chain, a long chain, continuous chain of monomers. Okay, so an individual glucose monosaccharide is considered a monomer, and we begin to link them together and make these long chains, we say polymer. The same way that amino acids are linked together to make long protein chains that are then folded into the protein. Okay, that's what I mean by a polymer. All right, so three steps to this pathway. Here are the three steps. Number one, phosphoglucose. This is such a great word. Phosphoglucomutase isomerizes glucose 6 phosphate to glucose 1 phosphate. So, what is happening here in this step? It's actually pretty simple. We're not adding anything to the molecule, we're just rearranging it. Okay, anytime you have an isomerase enzyme, we're just rearranging the molecule. All we're doing is we're taking the phosphate group on the 6 carbon and we're putting it on the 1 carbon. That's what that G1P is glucose 1 phosphate. Okay, so phosphoglucomutase does that. Then G1P is bonded to uridine triphosphate, yielding UDP. Okay, so what is this? So I have a picture of it right here. This is um, UDP glucose. This is kind of a weird molecule, um, but basically it's in this figure over here too. I'm gonna slide over. Um, we call it UTP, comes in, and we break off two phosphates. So it's just like ATP, it's just a different nucleic acid base. Instead of adenosine, it's uridine, okay? And we break off two phosphate groups. So you see those are produced right here. Two phosphate groups, break them off, and we just join up you, uh, the uridine base with the glucose. That's what's happening. So that's what, what I just circled right here. Here's the uridine part. Here is the two phosphate groups. So that's why we call it UDP, diphosphate. And then here is glucose in the circle. So it's all joined together, all right? Then the last thing is glycogen synthase takes this and it adds glucose. So it adds this part right here to a glycogen chain. It just adds on another, just like making a long train, you add on a car every time. It'd be like adding on an individual glucose molecule to make this long polymer. Um, which is ends up being glycogen, okay? So we, we lose the UDP, the, this, this whole part gets cleaved off, the uridine diphosphate, and we just add glucose to it. So UDP is kind of just like the chauffeur in essence. Okay, so this is what a picture of glycogen might look like. Okay, these are all glucose. So this would be an individual glucose unit right here. And it's in this, um, weird formation. There's boat and there's chair conformations. That's the technical names for them. You don't have to know those words, but that's just why you see all these different angles in the glucose. It's not a flat, straight um, six carbon ring like we usually draw, but don't let that freak you out. This is what um, glycogen will look like. And you see all these are linked together. These are held together by alpha one six glycosidic linkages, alpha one six. And we know alpha, the OH group points down 
So that's why you see it always oriented down at carbon one. So definitely know what kind of linkages hold glycogen together. It's alpha, not beta. And then it, from a bird's eye view, this is what glycogen would look like. All these little individual glucose monomers together. And the branch point, where's the branch point? I want you to know the branch point. We hit this in chapter 20, but very briefly, the branch point is on carbon six. So right here, this, oh, I just wrote over it. See how the six is right here? This carbon six, you can branch upwards. Now you can also link it together at carbon one. That's the normal regular linkage point is the carbon one. That's an alpha one four. You can also get an alpha one six linkage. That's, and that's why you get these really cool branch points and why glycogen can be so dense and we can store so much of it. So it's always one six and one four, is it? Yes. Ever? One four is the normal um, addition spot if we're gonna in, uh, elongate the polymer, but one six we can is, is what we call just the branch point. Okay, so that is glycogenesis. That's the formation of glycogen. Now, so that's like what insulin would help do. Insulin would prompt this to happen. But if we need glucose in our blood, we've got, to, we've got to have a way of taking glycogen and then breaking it down really quickly. That's where glucagon comes into play. So glucagon is our guy here. And we run the opposite of this, glycogenolysis, the biochemical pathway for the breakdown, or we could say the metabolism of glycogen to free glucose, free glucose monitors. Two steps here, and then I'll show you a picture of this. Number one, we have an enzyme, glycogen phosphorylase. So we're gonna take this long polymer unit right here, and we're gonna, we're gonna hydrolyze, break apart the alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond, break it off, and then we're gonna immediately phosphorylate it at carbon one. Okay, so let me read number point number one. Glycogen phosphorylase produces glucose 1-phosphate by hydrolyzing the alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond and phosphorylating glucose simultaneously at carbon one. That's why it says we produce glucose 1-phosphate. That's where the phosphate group goes. Okay, so that's the first step. We're gonna break off the individual glucose monomer. Now we need to convert it to G6P glucose 6-phosphate so that it can run through because glucose 6-phosphate is the first intermediate in glycolysis, right? Hexokinase phosphorylates uh, glucose to G6P. So if we can make G6P, we can jump into glycolysis, okay? <clears throat> or we can make glucose and dump glucose into our blood. Okay, so this happens, part A, is that a thought uh, I'm having trouble even saying this, phosphoglucomutase isomerizes um, glucose 1-phosphate to G6P, and then we can enter glycolysis if we need ATP, or uh, we can just make G6P uh, in liver cells, G6P phosphatase. So a phosphatase is the opposite of a kinase. It dephosphorylates it, and then we just get glucose, which we can, so there's two destinations. There's two destinations. So the picture down below will maybe clear this up because sometimes I, I have a hard time seeing all this if it's just words. So let me scroll down. Here's the two destinations. We either need to break down glycogen so that we can make ATP or so that we can dump glucose into our blood. Those are the two things. We need to break down glycogen, number one, so that we can either make ATP or make glucose and dump glucose into our blood because we have a falling glucose concentration in our blood. So for number one, if we need glucose in our blood, we break down glycogen this way right here, glycogen phosphorylase, we make G1P, then the, the, the phosphoglucomutase makes G6P, and then we desphosphorylate it and we get glucose. And we can throw that into our blood so that our concentrations in our blood stay healthy. But if we need ATP, that happens in our liver and skeletal muscles, um, 
glyco it's a little bit simpler in skeletal muscles. We take glycogen, same enzyme, glycogen phosphorylase, and we make glucose one phosphate um, in our skeletal muscles. From there, it can be transported to the liver where we make G6P. Here, we can just straight up enter glycolysis. Okay, uh, L-Y-S. Spell that right, I think it did. All right, so these are the two destinations. We can make glucose and dump it into our blood, or we can make G6P, stop there, and then run glycolysis. And, and that will lead to the production of ATP, ultimately, okay? So to, I want you to know from this, you don't necessarily have to know these steps individually, but I want you, if I ask you what would be the, like, the purpose of um, glycogenolysis, the breakdown of, of glycogen, I would want you to be able to tell me like what the end products would be. Like, well, we're, we're doing this so that we can increase the blood glucose levels because we have a falling blood glucose level, or we're gonna make G6P uh, and we're gonna run glycolysis because we need ATP in the body, okay? And this is if, we, we just simply are either on like a low carb diet or we, for some reason we don't, we've been fasting or dieting and we don't have enough glucose in our, our blood and our body and we're running low on energy. Questions on that? Okay, this leads us to our last slide. So the last pathway, the last really complicated word that starts with G, Gluconeogenesis. So definitely make sure you know the difference between glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, glycogenesis, glycogenolysis, okay? Um, gluconeogenesis. This is the synthesis of glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. It's really cool that our body can pull its reserves and use protein metabolites, lactate, uh, other molecules to make glucose if needed. All right, so this is a long pathway. You can see this whole pathway here. I'm not gonna walk you through every step of this. Several steps are identical to glycolysis. These steps right here in red, these are the same steps, enzymes and intermediates found in steps four through nine of glycolysis, but some steps are different. So the ones highlighted in blue, these are different enzymes um, than what you would find in glycolysis. So some steps are the same, some steps are different. You can notice early on in gluconeogenesis, we have to invest a lot of energy. GTP or ATP are invested in the first couple of steps. And then we produce it back at uh, whoop, five, step five as well. Uh, but then ultimately we make glucose, which can um, run into glycolysis and, pr and produce ATP that way. So we can get ATP back on the back end, uh, but we have to invest it on the front end to run some of these steps, okay? So why is gluconeogenesis important? This is what I want you to know. It's utilized to meet energy demands when stores of glucose and glycogen have all been used. And remember I said that represents less than 1% of our energy reserves. Um, so what molecules can feed into gluconeogenesis? Well, pyruvate is the first one. Pyruvate is, is like the, the reactant molecule. That's kind of like the starting material for gluconeogenesis. Pyruvate can be turned into glucose. In addition to pyruvate, there's another entryway over here, glycerol. You guys remember what glycerol looks like? I'm gonna draw a picture of it. It was three carbons in a row. We, did, we looked at this when we talked about lipids and we said this is CH2OH, this would be CHOH and CH2OH. Okay, so glycerol, Lipids, um, triacylglycerols have uh, glycerol as the backbone piece. But that molecule can be converted to look at this DHAP. Do you remember writing this abbreviation earlier today in glycolysis? This is an intermediate in glycolysis DHAP dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Glycerol can be converted to dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and then that can jump into gluconeogenesis to remake glucose if we need more as well. Okay, so don't focus on all the individual steps here. I want you to know the overall purpose. Um, I want you to know 
what the starting material is, what molecules can feed into gluconeogenesis, pyruvate and glycerol. And, and when our body would resort to that, this pathway. Okay. All right. That's the end of lecture. Well, that took a long time. Well, we talked quite a bit at the beginning. That's chapter 22. So um, I will, after we finish, we're going to go over exam three. I'm not going to stop sharing my screen because I'm about to jump over to exam three, but um, I will after we finish today. So we're going to hit exam three. Then I will post the homework questions for chapter 22 and the recommended textbook problems for chapter 22. I'll upload an updated version of the syllabus. They'll be on there in our Blackboard classroom. And uh, you can go to the homework folder to find the questions for chapter 22. And then I'll have my office hour, 2.30, 3.30 today. And um, I think that's it. I did have want you, to, yes, Robin or Maggie. Have you sent out the test yet? I was just wondering, cause I don't have mine on my email. No, I need to send that to y'all right now. 